Along with trooping fairies is a whole slew of solitary fairies who prefer to reside in the world of the living. Fairy, it would seem, is more or less a generic term for any magical creature, as they take many forms, from mermaids to elves to headless horsemen, and for the next couple of videos I hope to shed a bit of light on them. Today we're going to be talking about leprechauns and some of their lesser known relatives, same source as last time. Although typically being depicted as wearing green, leprechauns are typically clad in coats of grey with leather aprons and a red cap. They are fairly crotchety in temperament and enjoy drinking and smoking in excess. For this, along with their swearing, the trooping fairies prefer not to associate with them. This is perhaps the reason why they roam the world of the living rather than the paradise of Tirna Nog. Leprechauns are about as tall as a 10 or 12 year old boy and are noted for not being much to look at, especially in contrast with their fairer relatives. Leprechauns are honored for being excellent cobblers and bankers. A leprechaun is usually found working away at a shoe. Fairies wear through shoes quite quickly on account of all the dancing and partying they do. This keeps the demand high and the leprechauns affluent. Leprechauns are tasked with guarding the vast wealth of the fairies. Fairies are fantastically wealthy, though their treasure is nigh unobtainable. Even when not well within the borders of Tir Nanog, their loot is guarded by ferocious cats and serpents. Even after acquiring fairy jewels and gold, it may well just turn to dust. Humanity and fairy treasure don't tend to find themselves together. It just isn't meant to be. The leprechaun's job wouldn't be nearly as hard if fairy treasure didn't emit rainbows like a beacon from it, and mortal humans hadn't caught on to this. The task of robbing a leprechaun seems like it should be easy enough, given their short legs, beer gut, drunkenness, and constant rainbow beacon declaring their presence. But only very rarely can a mortal get the best of the leprechaun. Upon meeting the leprechaun, he manages to distract you by telling you some of the many stories he's gathered over the millennia of his life and slip away without giving you a cent. And by then, you've forgotten why you were there. I interpret this as a sort of magic that makes you slowly forget that you were just demanding treasure. A smarter mortal once demanded that he declare the location of his treasure. Upon revealing the location of it buried under a tree, he tied his red scarf around the tree to mark it and demanded that when he returned with a shovel that the treasure and scarf would be in place. The leprechaun agreed and was true to his word, as is typical, but when the man came back, every other tree in the forest had an identical red scarf around it, and the leprechaun was gone. Unlike trooping fairies, leprechauns have a better grasp on the concept of future consequences. Fairies are immortal and so live so passionately and intensely that if not for the leprechaun's financial advice, the fairies would have gone bankrupt millennia ago. Trooping fairies have little concept on the value of the dollar, much to the chagrin of the poor leprechaun who undergoes about as much trouble as fairies as mortals when it comes to pilfering the treasury. Those who haven't tried to rob leprechauns but rather befriend them have found them to be quite generous. Once a recently impoverished noble had a leprechaun ride on his horse since they were heading the same way, and when the noble returned home he found his castle no longer sacked and his rooms filled to the top with gold coins. He may offer to his friends not only a drink, but a coin purse that will forever replenish the shilling within. No, how manner, no matter how many times the shilling has been spent, a new one takes its place as soon as it's opened. On an extremely generous occasion, a mortal was gifted with a horse's bridle, 
and when shaken it would produce a yellow horse. Lesser known than the leprechaun, perhaps for good reason, is the chloracon. If the leprechaun is a hard-working cobbler and or banker who, despite being a bit of a grumpy drunk, is generally of good nature, the chloracon is his deadbeat cousin. They would appear to be much the same species as the leprechaun, looking nearly identical to them if not for the pink tinge on their nose, which may merely be brought out from an excess of booze anyway. Leprechauns are hard workers, though the chloracon is anything but. They are all the more rude, and certainly all the more drunk. They wear clothes typical of an 18th century weekend party-goer, and are noted for the silver buckles on their shoes, the gold lace on their cap, and their pale blue stockings. They will gladly, and without any inhibition, walk into a rich man's wine cellar and not leave until every last casket had been downed. No self-respecting leprechaun drinks anything other than beer. For their amusement, the clericon enjoys hopping onto the back of pigs, sheep, and dogs, and have a proper joy ride through the bogs and fields well through the night, until the animal is left muddy and exhausted. Leprechauns are sure to disprove of their rowdy cousins, being proud of their work ethic and class. Even if they go, don't get along perfectly with the trooping fairies, they at least have that honor. Some say that the chloricons are just leprechauns who have had a bit too much to drink, and then later, when they wake up, they'll be the first to voice their disapproval of such behavior, with no one ever suspecting them. But be sure to not to suggest this near a leprechaun. They'd surely be offended whether or not it's true. Another similar being, perhaps another faction of the same species, and I say perhaps because that's just my interpretation, mind you, is the Far Darig. Far Darig is an Anglicization of Fair Dirac, which is Gaelic for Red Man. He gets this title from his typical red attire, though he prefers to go about invisibly most of the time. If not for his space being splotched with yellow and buttermilk cloths and red sugar loaf hat, cape, and stocks, he would resemble the leprechauns and chloracons quite closely, having the same short and stocky build. While other fairies enjoy pranking mortals from time to time, the far darig takes it to the next level. His only real passion or hobby seems to be pranking mortals, and he is gifted for it. Their pranks are typically quite gruesome, but they always end with the person safe, if a bit rattled, in exchange. They always make sure to gift you in return, whether it be luck or otherwise. They have a sort of magic that allows them to manipulate their voice to sound just like anything, from waves to wolves to an army. A typical prank is to invite mortals into their hut for dinner, and when they enter, they demand you cook the old woman he has prepared in the corner. The person invariably faints, because people just do that, apparently. I've never seen it, but movies and stories would have you believe it's normal. Anyway, they wake up after fainting, and with no sign of their hut in sight, they hear laughing all around them, with no distinct source. If you encounter one, you can say, Do not mock me in Gaelic, and he will not be able to prank you, but by the time you realize what's happening, it's typically too late for this spell. A notorious Fardarig named, however the hell you say that, had a fondness for music, so he would prank as many musicians as he could. If they were reluctant to play for him, he would keep on pranking them until he got what he wanted out of them. The far darig will often walk into your house and demand whiskey and a pipe and a sofa and a comfortable hearth in the winter. If his wishes are met and you be a good host to him and the house is kept clean and warm, he will be sure to make the household prosper and all living there will find great fortune and happiness in their life. One individual would stick his arm through the keyhole, keyhole of the door and make himself at home every day at 11 o'clock. A.M. or P.M. we don't get to know. A far darig, if respected and not booted out, might well destroy the home and their cattle. 
whenever fairy wars come about, I talked about these about two episodes ago now, a Fardarig will serve as the general. He'll use magic to turn someone into a horse to ride into battle. That was my phone. Interestingly, when Scottish witches ride host a human steed, it's taken as satanic, but the Fardarig gets away with it just fine. Although I suppose the Fardarig is Irish and not Scottish, and ideas varied greatly from region to region because they didn't exactly have internet and phones, but I digress. A piper was once written to battle by a red man, and he was rewarded for his contribution with a lifetime supply of tobacco. I have a book of Scottish fairy tales called An Illustrated Treasury of Scottish Folk and Fairy Tales by Teresa Breslin. Sorry about this keyboard. One of the stories mentions a figure that reminds me of the Irish leprechaun, Clericon, and Fardarig, called the Wee Folk, or Other People. They feature the same short and stocky build, and they dress in all green, though unlike the others mentioned in this video, there are female wee folk. The story involves a single woman with a baby whose sow pig begins to die. Knowing that they would starve to death without the animal, a passing wee person offered to help, and she asked, What would you give me if I fix your pig? The good wife said to her, Anything at all. After the wee folk pressed that she would give her absolutely anything at all, and the good wife failed to expect any kind of wicked intent from her. She cured the pig, but in payment she took away her baby. She, the good wife tracked down this wee person for a long time, and knowing that you have power over a wee person if you learn their true name, she was lucky enough to hear her sing, Little Ken's the good wife at Haim, that whoopity story is my name and through knowing her name, she was able to get her baby back. This is genuinely a really wonderful book, by the way, and I highly recommend it to anyone who likes the sort of things I talk about. Due to the similarity in stature and scheming nature of the wee folk, I couldn't help but compare this figure to the Leprechaun, Clericon, and Fardarig. In my head canon, they are all different factions of the same species of fairy, but, of course, people in the past didn't classify the world in such neat terms as this. The existence of these creatures speaks to a lost era, when alongside people walked a whole world of creatures, magic helpful and deadly. I've never seen a narwhal, and I probably never will, but people tell me that they're real, so why wouldn't they be? So long as their nature is consistent with the rest of the world. These creatures, along with other elves, brownies, and hobgoblins, were just as real as anything else to these people. What reason would you have not to assume that leprechauns were real if others in your society were said to see them regularly? There were people in the 1800s when interviewed who said that they would not believe that in the far north there were bears that were white unless an educated person from the region told them otherwise, since they had only ever seen bears of brown and black. In the last few centuries, we've begun to understand the way the world works, so if you have no way knowing that polar bears exist, what makes them different than a leprechaun? A white bear isn't consistent with the bears we see, after all. I say this with the intention of empathizing with the way people thought in the past. People weren't any more stupid and crazy than they are today. They just had a lot less to work with.